Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Take your copy of the Word of God and turn with And so, look with me, if you don't mind, in the Gospel record, or in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, in chapter number 12, as we begin our brand new series tonight, the book of Acts, chapter number 12... And notice with me, if you don't mind, starting at verse number 12. Acts chapter 12 and verse number 12. And notice with me, if you don't mind, in Acts 12, 12, it says, And when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark the phrase that we find in the book of Acts chapter 12? Acts chapter 12 and verse 12. And notice the name of the person we're covering here, John, whose surname was Mark. John, whose surname was Mark. And with this, we're covering the idea here of John Mark, the recovered backslider. John Mark, the recovered backslider backslider. And if you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God, a God who is worthy to be worshiped and worthy to be served. As we come to you now, we're just asking that you would do something in our midst, that you would do something with us in what we're doing tonight. As we start off this brand new series, let it be a series full of faith and full of hope, a full of encouragement that you would do something now. And we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we begin the gospel record of Mark, we want to start by doing a character study on the human penman, which would be John Mark, the person who the gospel record was named after. And so who is this John Mark? Uh, It wasn't too long ago that I had a brand new Christian come to me and said, who is this Mark? I understand that Jesus had 12 disciples, and, but I don't see his name as one of the disciples. Where did he come from? How did he exist? How did it put together? Tell me about it. And I was able to sit and maybe give a short recap of this message to him. And so it is important to understand the human penman. Who did God use to pen the gospel record of Mark? And how did we get this? What was its purpose for? And so if you don't mind, I'd like to take the word of God and just kind of walk through the scriptures and see what the scriptures say concerning this young man named John Mark. We start off in the gospel, in the book of Acts chapter number 12 when we're first introduced to John Mark. And this is in the midst of something very important. This is when Peter was put into prison. We had spoken about this just the other day. Here's Peter. He's placed into prison. They've already killed <coughs> James, the brother of John, with a sword. And Peter was next in line. Peter had already resigned his fate to the Lord that God, whatever you would like me to do, I trust you. And so he went to sleep. But God wasn't done with Peter yet. And so there was a great earthquake in the middle of the night that opened up the chains that kept Peter bound. It opened up the doors that kept Peter locked in. And Peter was still asleep even after the earthquake. And some of you are heavy sleepers like that too. Because he wouldn't wake up, God had an angel come and kick him and say, get up. And so Peter realized what happened and got up. And he went to where the church was gathered, the church of Jerusalem. And they were gathered together at a location. What location were they gathered? Notice with me again in verse number 12. And when he, that's Peter, had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark where many were gathered together praying. Where was it that Peter went? Where did he say the church would be gathered at? Well, he knew that many were gathered together in the house of John Mark. Now, it was his mother's house. He was a young man at this time. But can you imagine what it would be like to have all those people gathered together in your house praying? 
and praying for a miracle. And indeed a miracle. God, free Peter. Free Peter. And sure enough, Peter knocked on the door and the young little girl opened the door and said, it's Peter. And she didn't even unlock the door, came back in and told everyone, it's Peter, it's Peter. And they all denied it. No, it's not Peter. But you understand it was that prayer meeting that they saw an impossible prayer answered. And John Mark was there. It was in his house where the people gathered together and they saw God work. And so when we see this young man, we can see he grew up in a Christian home. It was a home that invited people to come and pray. It was a home where they saw miracles happen and prayers answered. What a great uh, privilege he had. Notice if you don't mind, we continue to see what happens to John Mark. Continue with me in the gospel rec- or in the book of Acts chapter 12. In the book of Acts chapter 12, and notice with me if you don't mind, in verse number 25. Acts chapter 12 and verse number 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John whose surname was Mark. So what we have is that Barnabas and Saul had went to go fulfill some things in the city of Jerusalem. They were currently pastoring in the church of Antioch, which was a distance away. But as they came by, Barnabas says, hey, here's my nephew, John Mark. Paul or Saul, let's take him. I think he'll be a great help. He's already loves the Lord. He's already watched things happen. He's been growing in the Lord. Great. Let's take him with us. Saul said, that's fine, the more the merrier, let's go. And so they go up to the church of Antioch. If you don't mind, let's see him as he pops up again in the next chapter, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and if you don't mind, in verse number 13. Now what has happened in this time is that Barnabas and Saul have been sent out by the church of Antioch to go into a missionary journey. In Acts chapter 13, they are in the midst of their missionary journey. And so notice with me in verse number 13. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Pergia in uh, Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, they're in the midst of their first missionary journey. They started to run into some hard times. They ran into a sorcerer and a false prophet who were trying to convince people that, that Paul's, what Paul is preaching is not correct and tried to erase everything that was done. And so Paul had to deal with him. And John Mark saw firsthand how hard the ministry was, how hard it was to be a missionary. Most people, when they have an idea that they're going to be a missionary, they have the idea that when they get off the plane, that all the native people are going to meet them outside the plane and say, oh, great missionary, we've been waiting for you. But he'll find out pretty quickly that the people don't want them there. And that's the same no matter where people go. People don't want the Christians there. They don't like that style. They don't want that thing. And that the ministry is a lot harder than what most people think it's going to be. And so John Mark said, whoa, whoa, whoa. This, I didn't sign up for this. this. It's not as glamorous as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be easier that we would just say some words and people would get saved. I thought it would be the idea that everyone wants to be a Christian. And not everyone wants to be a Christian. And so what John Mark said went, and you could imagine having a meeting with Uncle Barnabas and said, Barnabas, uh, I'm not cut out for this. I thought I was. Thank you for inviting me, but I'm just going to be a hindrance. Barnabas says, but we brought you on to be our servant. Your, your job was to carry uh, our things for us, to be a servant. He says, I'll find someone else for you. I just can't do this. I'm going home. And so he packed his bags. He left the mission field and he went back home to Mama. But during this time, he went back and got immediately back in church. Praise the Lord for that, that he didn't get out of church. But he went back home and went to the church of Jerusalem. It was in that time that under those pastors that they preached to him. And they got him some encouragement. And he began to get strengthened up. And he began to make a decision to follow after the Lord. And things began to change for him again. 
notice if you don't mind, as he begins to get right with the Lord, that Paul and Barnabas decide they're going to go out in another missionary journey. Notice with me in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 in verse number 36. Acts chapter 15 in verse number 36, we see John Mark pop up again. Notice with me in Acts 15 in verse 36. And some days later, after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him from them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. So what we have here is that Mark decided he was going to get back into church. He was going to start growing in the Lord, start getting discipled and start being prepared. This time he knew that he was ready. So he went up to Barnabas and said, Uncle Barnabas, I'm so sorry what I did last time and I was wrong and I, I, I'm better now. I'm stronger in my faith. I can handle it now this time and, and I want to be a missionary. I believe this is what God wants me to do and I want to go with you. And Uncle Barnabas says, I have no problems with that. I would love for you to come with us. I think that's a great idea. Let me go talk to Paul about this and we'll get things on the way. And so Barnabas comes to Paul and says, Paul, hey, we're getting ready to go. This is a great idea that you have to go visit all the churches again. I'm excited. I can't wait to go see those people that, that we saw come to know Christ as their Savior. Oh, this is great. Hey, uh, by the way, uh, my nephew, John Mark, he wants to go with us. You can almost see that Paul put down his pencil, pen and his quill and say, listen, you said what? I want to take John Mark with us. That quitter? You know what he did last time? He left us in a lurch. He said he was going to help us and then halfway it got too hard for him and he went back home to mama. That same John Mark? Well, he's better now. Listen, he's just going to quit on us again and I don't want to have any quitter to go with us. But Paul, you don't understand. He's grown in the Lord. He's ready to go. He's my nephew. I think he's ready. Listen, Barnabas, I respect everything that you do, but I'm not taking a quitter. I'm not taking him. He's just going to hurt us again, and we already have enough hurts in the ministry. Barnabas says, listen, I respect what you do. But this is my nephew. And let me tell you, I talked with him. He is ready to go. He's going to be a help. He's not going to run this time. Paul says, listen, I'm, not, I'm drawing a line on this. You can come with me, but he cannot. Barnabas says, if he doesn't go, I don't go. Paul says, I hate to see this way, but if that's how you feel. I'm not taking him. I don't want him to hurt. And so they split ways because of John Mark. Now, I want you to think about John Mark. Can you imagine how bad he feels right now? I mean, not only did he leave Saul and Barnabas and alerts the first missionary journey. But now one of the greatest missionary duos of all time, Barnabas and Saul, Paul and Barnabas, have now split up because of his actions, because of his past. You say, who was right, Paul or Barnabas? Don't know. All I know is this is what happened. And so they quit. They split up. Barnabas went out and continued in the missionary journey and took uh, John Mark with him. But what Saul did in verse number 40, And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. He chose Silas and said, Silas, you're my new partner. Let's go out. You say, is that the end of it? Is that all that happens? Is that there was a big fight? Well, it just so happens that God started to do a lot of things in John Mark's life to prove that he was faithfully used of God. That even though he had a past, he didn't let that just hold him down. Because he failed in the past didn't mean that he was useless forever. But he got right, he got trained, got retreaded, got retired up. And he left to go serve God, however you want me to do. And yeah, there was consequences for his action. But aren't you glad that he did not let that be his defining moment? He pressed forward. He messed up. 
but he still can move forward. And I'm so thankful for that. You know what the Christian life is? It's a series of new beginnings. You can't do anything about the past. All you can do is start from where you are and move forward. Sure, you messed up in your past. Yes, you could have messed up in a major way with consequences that still remain today. But that doesn't have to be your defining moment. You could start from where you are and move forward now. You could continue to move forward. Well, that's exactly what happened in John Mark's life. Notice what happens the next time we find him in history in the book of Colossians chapter 2. The book of Colossians chapter 2. We know that John Mark traveled with Barnabas and guess what? He did not quit. He did not fail. He kept moving forward. And next thing you know, Paul is even recommending him. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in Colossians chapter 2. And notice with me in verse number 10. Colossians chapter 2. And that is not the passage I was looking for. Forgive me. Well, if you don't mind, I will find that to you later. Nope, it's uh, chapter 4. Mar uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 10. Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 10. And notice as Paul is giving his salutations and his greetings at the end of this epistle of Colossians. Colossians chapter 4 verse 10. And Artistarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas. That means nephew. So this is John Mark. Touching whom you have received commandments. If he come to you, notice what Paul said, receive him. So he's writing to the church of Colossae. And Paul says, hey, you hear about John Mark? You hear about Marcus, uh, Barnabas' nephew? If he comes by, you receive him. He's going to be a help to you. Let me tell you, I could recommend this young man to the ministry. He's going to be a help. Aren't you glad that John Mark didn't quit? He kept moving forward and he proved himself in the eyes of Paul. So much that Paul is telling other churches, here's a young preacher that's going to do you some good. Here's a young preacher I endorse. He's going to be a help to you. Oh, that tune has changed. Paul's not saying he's going to quit now. He's saying he's going to help. He's going to help. Notice as we see him once again in the book of 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. The book of 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Paul is at the very end. He's fixing to get a shortcut to glory. He's going to be beheaded by Nero soon. And he writes this last letter to his son of the faith, Timothy. And notice the instructions he gives in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Notice with me in verse 11. Paul is saying, only Luke is with me. Take Mark, this is John Mark, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So at the end of his life, uh, Paul says, hey, I know I'm getting ready to die. I know you're coming with me, Timothy. I know you're going to come to see me, and I hope you get to me in time. But bring John Mark with me because he's profitable to me. He's profitable. He's a help to me. He could be a blessing to me. I want to see John Mark again. Notice, if you don't mind, we find him, find him once again in the Scriptures in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5. The book of 1 Peter, chapter number 5. Of course, 1 Peter is penned by the Apostle Peter. And notice with me in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 5, and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, it says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doeth Marcus, my son. This Marcus here, who most people believe, is John Mark. And so when he calls him my son, it's the idea of my son in the faith. This is John Mark who I've discipled, who I've been with. People say, who studied history of biblical things, that when John Mark quit the first missionary journeys with Saul and Barnabas, that he went back to Jerusalem. And guess who was there at Jerusalem? Peter. And so John Mark came aside and began to follow Peter. Peter discipled him and trained him and spent some time with him. And now he is um, Peter's son of the faith. Just like Timothy and Titus were Paul's sons in the faith, 
John Mark was Peter, son of the faith. He would spend time with him and talk with him. And as John Mark's traveling with Peter, he was sure to ask Peter often, what was it like to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? Mark would take all of these things to heart and wrote the gospel record of Mark, which is highly influenced from Peter's perspective. The gospel record of Mark, as it's talking from Peter's perspective, is a great uh, gospel record because it shows Jesus Christ as the perfect servant. The whole idea of the gospel record of Mark is that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but you know what Jesus did? He came to save many. He came to die for us. He came not on earth so that we can serve him. He came on earth the first time to be our sacrifice on Calvary. He came to do something for us. And so the gospel record of Mark shows Jesus as the perfect servant. The gospel record of Mark is written to the Roman mind and it shows continual action. There are 16 chapters within the gospel record of Mark. 12 of those chapters start with the word and. And so it's showing action after action after action after action. The gospel record of Mark has very few Old Testament quotations because it's written to the Roman mind, to the Gentile mind. It's not written to the Hebrew mind, and so it doesn't quote a lot of Old Testament uh, scriptures. It explains the Jewish customs. So as if there was a reader who did not know all these Jewish customs, it would explain the customs. What is going on here? Why are they doing this? It, ex- it uh, ignores the Mosaic law. So it doesn't talk about the law of Moses and how these things were to come to pass. And it indicates when a Passover lamb was killed. And it goes on and explains these things because it's writing to a Gentile mind. A mind that is not familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. All of these point to a Gentile audience. The gospel record of Mark is interesting because it begins when Peter joined himself to the Lord. So what this is, it's, it's the voice of Peter even though it was written by the hand of Mark. Can you imagine this uh, gospel record was written approximately 50 AD. Think about Paul that he's in prison somewhere. And someone comes by and says, Hey, Paul, have you seen this new letter? Have you seen this new book that's out? No, let me read it. And so he takes the gospel record of Mark and begins to thumb through it and read through it. He says, who wrote this? Is this Peter? Did Peter write this? And, say, and someone will say, no, John Mark did. John Mark did this? And he goes back and rereads this. And this is amazing. Look at what God did with John Mark. Now again, the gospel record of Mark is very important because it tells things from Peter's perspective. So as we go through the book, I want you to remind remind yourself, this is written through Peter's eyes. Peter was an eyewitness of the Lord. He witnessed these things and he just sent spent time to talk to his son in the faith, John Mark, and said, let me tell you about the time that I saw the Lord do this. And let me tell you about the time that I saw the Lord do this. And let me explain to you about the time that I saw the Lord do this. Aren't you glad that John Mark was usable in that way? You know what? He had a failure in life, but he did not let that failure dominate him. He did not let that failure define him. He said, I can't do anything about the past. All I can do is start from where I am and move forward. Again, that's the message I give you tonight. We know that there's lots of things going on. But you know one thing that our current situation is allowing us to have? Is a brand new start. You know, things can't operate the same they were, the same way they were operating a week ago. Two weeks ago, a month ago, things are no longer the same. But you know what this does is it gives everyone a clean state, slate. You could start brand new habits right now. You can't do anything about how you started the year, but you could do something about what you're going to do with the rest of it. Since you now have time, I'm going to schedule time to read my Bible. Since I have time, I'm going to schedule time to pray. Since I have time and since my schedule's different, I'm going to put new habits in my life. You know, since I have this brand new clean slate, because everything's now changed, I'm going to do things different in my life from this point forward. 
You know we have that great opportunity now. One of the things that this current crisis has done. Is it got rid of the traditions in your life. Got rid of some of those things you were doing just by rote. We got to the place even in churches. Where we knew when to stand up. When to sit down. We knew when we were supposed to sing. When we were supposed to be quiet. When to fold our hands in our laps. When we're supposed to do this. But now this is all changed. Everything is different. And you know what God has done? Is he allowed us an opportunity to start over in many areas in our life. What are you going to do with this time? Are you going to do things different? Or are you going to use this opportunity to make a decision and a purpose that you're going to move forward? Are you going to get stronger because of the current crisis? Are you going to be stronger in your faith because of what is going on? Start from where you are, wherever you are, and move forward. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.